Good morning, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining and taking time out of your day. I'm about to introduce uh, Natalie Jack. Uh, so, Natalie, I'll get you straight into the stream. How are you doing this morning, Natalie? Hi, good. Thanks, Yanni. How are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. And uh, thank you also for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, because you are super busy, and we'll get into all that um, in a moment. But perhaps tell us uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, Natalie, um, what you've been doing and and where you're at. Oh, well, that's a, that's a good question to start with. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate your time as well for having me on today. Um, look, I'm, my background is in music therapy. I'm a registered music therapist. Um, I have done lots of different clinical work in Australia and also overseas. And throughout my career, I've been really interested in supervision um, and also really interested in technology. So I think today um, that's what we're going to talk about is the supervision technology and how music therapists and, and other allied health can access technology to make the best out of their work. So what I do now is... Um, I provide supervision to um, music therapists and other allied health professionals and other health professionals at large, um, and uh, and I do a bit of it's still some clinical work in music therapy as well. Fantastic, Natalie. So um, maybe for those who aren't as familiar, um, tell us about music therapy. Sure. Yeah, music therapy is an allied health profession. So it's uh, we we say it's a research based profession. So there's lots of research out there that supports music therapy as an allied health profession. And what it does is it supports uh, clients, consumers, and patients to achieve their goals using the power of music and the relationship formed through using music and music activities. So it's uh, it's yeah, it's a rigid allied health profession. And uh, and nowadays in in Australia to become a music therapist, it's it's a master's minimum qualification. So we're uh, we're, um, we're really doing some good things in the academic world and there's lots of research, lots of PhDs out there as well with music therapy and there's some fantastic clinical work going on in lots of different areas, kids with disabilities, palliative care, mental health, um, rehabilitation, cancer care, all kinds of, anywhere you'll find any other allied health professionals, you can find a music therapist. Fantastic. I remember uh, some years ago I watched uh, a TED, uh, might have been a TED talk or a TEDx talk, um, the, the name that comes to mind, Erin Siebert, I think it is, um, did a talk about music therapy. Uh, this this is a good four or five years ago, I think, from memory. Yeah, yeah. And There's been a few music therapists who've done TED talks, including uh, Australia's um, Katrina McFerrin. She's oh, a fantastic. Professor. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to, have to check that out. I, I just remember the impression that it made on me because um, – that particular talk was sort of talking about the, um, uh, you know, making people more aware about the value of music therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and as you pointed out, some of the uh, uh, clinical uh, effort that needs to go into becoming a music therapist and mm -hmm. um, uh, and being able to achieve that status as well. Um, I personally relate to it, uh, uh, you know, as I've said to you on other occasions, uh, as a mm -hmm aspiring uh, musician at one point in my life and um, I found that uh, through some of my stormy waters in my younger life um, that music personally was very good for me. Um, so, you know, what, what motivated you to get into it? Well, I think your story actually resonates with a lot of us music therapists. A lot of us have started as musicians and found that, you know, music was great for us in our own lives. And and um, personally, I you know, I was I did some music teaching as a as a young adult, and I learnt um, I did a degree in music. and And I thought, you know, I love teaching and I love performing, but there's something more about music that that I can give here. And I loved helping people and I loved music and really music therapy for me combi combines both of those things, a health profession where I can help people and, and, and using the power of music that we, that a lot of us, as you say, know is, is very powerful in our own lives. It is amazing, isn't it? And, and there's, there's so much to the, you know, the frequency of music, isn't it? You know, that sort of, it's one of those things that creates so much mood and, um, uh, you know, there are um, uh, plenty of people who perhaps don't have all of their senses who can still relate to music as well, particularly, um, you know, uh, examples where people uh, perhaps don't hear but they actually feel, you know, the music as well. Have you kind of experienced that through your journey where yeah, how just how yeah. powerful music is to break through? Yeah, absolutely. There is um, there's a lot of different aspects of music that can be that can be helpful and that can be healing. And and what I think what you're talking about is is um, another profession that's kind of a side profession called sound therapy. So using the frequencies of music to affect the body on a physiological level. So there's absolutely, there's different applications for music um, across many professions and different kinds of areas for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, how have you found the transition of late, you know, in terms of how you were doing things perhaps um, three to six months ago versus yeah. how things are being done now? Yeah, look, it's been a really 
Amazing, amazing time to be a music therapist and to be a health professional. Um, personally, I, I guess, transitioned to doing a lot of telehealth with my supervisees. About seven years ago, I started doing work online because I recognised that not everyone could travel and my client base was all over Australia and potentially overseas as well. So using telehealth for supervision purposes is something that I've done, um, yeah, for quite a while now. So um, when this, when the COVID-19 crisis began, I really um, thought this is something I can do to help other people because there were a whole bunch of music therapists all over the country and in fact over the world who were, um, yeah, needing to jump online right away and and to do their sessions online. So for me, it's been fantastic because I've been able to give back. I did a couple of webinars, um, free webinars for the community to show them, you know, this is the basics of telehealth and this is how they can, uh, this is how they can implement it in their lives. So it's been, um, it's been a massive learning curve, but I've, as I said, been very grateful that I could help other music therapists to bring their businesses online. And I've had lots of discussions with music therapists about how that's been for them and it's been yeah a massive learning curve but something that's been largely positive it kind of breaks down barriers of travel um it breaks down barriers of of uh of certain things to do with um what am I trying to say? Certain things to do with, you know, infection control, obviously, in these times. So, yeah, so music therapists moving to telehealth has been, uh, it's been an amazing experience. That's fantastic. What, what have you found have been sort of the key things that um, in delivering uh, music therapy online, um, what are the key things that you would be suggesting to people in your community now on, you know, sort of getting that right or perhaps what a, what a best practice approach is to doing it? Yeah, sure. Look, I think we're all worried about security on the internet and I think getting the security of the platform and you and I've talked about this in regards to Core Plus, um, getting the security of your platform is the number one thing and making sure that we're keeping our own information and our clients' information safe. So that in terms of best practice is researching and looking very, very deeply into the platforms that you're going to use and um, and making a, a really good decision based on, uh, based on facts. Um, and then the... The therapeutic relationship, that's the other thing, is getting that therapeutic relationship right. It's not always easy even in person. So getting it right online um, is also something that I talk about being best practice. And sometimes it can take take a bit of a bit of doing. You know, you can maybe have a very short time with a client who's nervous about the online thing just to say hi, just to have a chat and try the technology out and make sure everybody's comfortable. And then the next time have a 10 minute session with a little bit of music and trying it out and getting them to be comfortable with it because it can be very foreign for people doing things online um, and then moving then slowly into doing full sessions online as they can tolerate that. So developing your therapeutic relationship in a slightly different way, in a measured way and in a very thought out way um, uh, online is something that's really helpful as well. Just sort of picking up, uh, you've got the guitar in the background there and uh, presumably there are other instruments that come into it. So is there any extra special attention you need to pay to things like microphones or perhaps how the actual workstation is um, is set up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is this is a topic of one of the webinars I gave with a couple of colleagues who are very um, who are very much into the tech side of things. So yes, the sound quality for music therapy, as you can imagine, um, is really important. So certain instruments work better online. It'd be, it's good to have a really good quality microphone. It's good to have a good quality guitar so that the sound comes through as best it possibly can. Also, again, looking at the platform, some platforms have um, special settings for music and some platforms don't so you want to really try and test out what is going to be the best for that sound quality in terms of um, those things like mics instrument quality things like that and also obviously the environment you're in you don't want to be in a noisy environment where there's people talking or you know work going on as much as possible you need it to be a quiet environment so yeah having an office or a quiet space is really important for that. Very good. And um, has it any sort of um, other tips that perhaps you could uh, offer people on how to go about sort of, you know, the intake, onboarding process, how you actually deal with the um, continuation or managing the expectations with, uh, with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is something that we talk about a lot in music therapy is that real um, getting people's informed consent. So whatever paperwork you normally have as 
as a clinician of onboarding clients, getting their information, we need to add in things now for telehealth. So we need to add in clauses like, you know, do you give permission for telehealth to occur and do you understand the risks and providing information to clients about risks um, and offering them the opportunity to, to ask questions and have anything explained to them that they need. So it's being even more transparent and overt in your communication than you normally would be and being a little bit patient perhaps and being happy to have more conversations with clients around answering questions about telehealth and the risks and benefits and the ways that we can do things. And unfortunately, there's a bit of troubleshooting that might have to come along with it too. So if your tech skills are really good, then you can help your clients troubleshoot. I've had quite a few music therapists say to me, oh, I really, it was hard because I couldn't help them with their iPad, you know, and being able to find creative ways to, um, to help clients with their tech issues is also part of what we can offer. Yeah, look, it's um, it's definitely the bane of a lot of um, technical people's existence. Uh, how much tech uh, needs support, uh, you know, and uh, and you know, I mean, I field questions every day from family and friends, uh, getting you know messages from people saying, oh, you know, how do I do this setting? How do I make this work? Um, but uh, but it's a really important part of it, is it? Because if uh, you know what what we what we recommend uh, amongst our client community is, uh, you know, whilst um, uh, the uh, Core Plus platform offers the teleconsult service. Uh, there's so many other moving parts in the internet. There's, you know, web browsers, cookies, there's internet access, there's firewalls. There's um, all sorts of things that can get in the way of a decent conversation between two people. That's right. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry, Natalie. It can be very frustrating for people to not be able to know how to fix these issues. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we sort of recommend that um, there's always a backup in place and that backup could be something like setting the setting the expectations up front that if there's anything that goes wrong with this session, um, we'll try and reinstate it or alternatively, if we can't get that done, I'll be giving you a call and we can do it over the phone, for example. And um, But whatever that process is to actually know that in advance so that inevitably if the tech does um, uh, have a problem, there's a failure in some way, there's always a workaround so that person's just not left there on their own. Um, yeah, I think I, I think we might have a little bit of bandwidth problem there as well. So the um, so so you've 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 come you've sort of you know you've been able to pivot quite quickly and you've got some good resources on your website. Uh, I noticed as far as um, being able to help um, people in the industry. And you're not necessarily just confining yourself to um, supporting and helping uh, music therapists. You you kind of have an allied health general type of approach with your uh, supervision. Um, tell us more about that. What's what's your um, what's your motivation for doing that, and and how are you actually doing that? Okay, thanks, Yanni. Yeah, look, I um, I've had an interest in supervision ever since I was a student in the late 90s actually in music therapy because I found my supervision experiences to be so pivotal in learning how to be an allied health professional, learning how to be a health professional. So over the years, I've been a music therapist now 20 years, so over the years I've, I've done a lot more um, research and training in supervision and it just, no matter how I look at it, it just always comes up that the support, professional support that therapists need and any health professionals need is, is supervision and it's just so important to get that right. Um, a lot of people do get supervision in their workplace. It may be good quality supervision. It may be not good quality supervision. And that's not the fault of the workplace or the supervisor. There's very little knowledge around in, in, in the general health population about supervision, unfortunately, and le le very little training available. So, so part of my motivation is to get that high quality supervision out to as many health professionals as possible. Um, my main clinical area is mental health. And so I have additional um, experiences and, and qualifications in mental health. And so I think that's given me um, a really good sense of of the overall needs of both clients and also of uh, different health professionals. So, so really what I'm looking at now is expanding out to all allied health and any health professionals to say, look, supervision is its own profession. And for those that can provide high quality supervision, it doesn't matter what background you come from. I'm not going to be teaching you how to be an OT or how to be a speechy or how to be a nurse, anything like that. My role as a supervisor is to help you to get the tools and the strategies to help manage yourself and support you through your work yourself if you can come up with those ideas and through my support that's the goal of supervision and so this interdisciplinary supervision if you will I think is a really important concept because we can't always access supervision from some people who are experienced and trained in supervision techniques can supervise anyone so you've um, you, you kind of uh, well you've had a really long uh, career, but you you've sort of described us uh, from an empathic standpoint. You know the roller coaster 
what's what's uh, what do you mean by that? And what's that been like for you? Well, look, I haven't had a smooth ride in my own career either. You know, I, I'm very open with my supervisees and with my my community that I have um, had episodes of burnout in my career. And part of that, I think, was due to not having the right support in place. So knowing what it's like to not feel supported, knowing what it's like to even question whether I'm in the right profession has really, I think, helped enhance my ability to be a good supervisor and to know what to offer people. So from a personal I guess personal slash professional standpoint, I really do know what it's like to struggle and have that roller coaster ride in a health profession. It's really tough to be a health professional at the moment in Australia. So, um, you know, that personal experience that I have really informs how I am as a supervisor and, and what I offer. And um, the, I think uh, the feedback I've had from my supervisees is it's actually really good to know that someone who can still be in the profession and can still be successful having had these ups and downs. And, and when I share my personal story, it seems to it seems to resonate with people, I guess. Yeah, well, I think that's um, that's part of the key to it is having that kind of um, sense that somebody's been there and done that and uh, they can um, help us kind of, you know, fast track things that perhaps would take us a little bit longer to work out for ourselves. Um, and you're sort of, you know, describing uh, just of late, it's, I mean, we're, we're all going through this incredible radical transformation at the moment. Mm. Um, what are you seeing as some of the, uh, you know, some of the, the key pain points right now for um, for allied health professionals to be thinking about? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Look, there's there's three things that have come up for me and for my clients. Uh, the first thing was, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose clients. That was the first fear when when this COVID happened and we had to reduce our face to face contact with people. The first thing was, I'm going to lose clients, and so managing that financial and this and the other excuse me, business stress around that was really key. Second thing was giving people the tools to do online stuff. So first thing was, oh, my goodness, I'm going to lose clients. The second thing was, no, maybe I can do telehealth. So providing people with those tools and that reassurance almost that you can do this. It's okay. Here's the basics of what you need. So how to do telehealth, how to change my whole business model in, you know, a week. That was the really big thing. So, um, and I'm really, really pleased to say music therapists, along with a whole bunch of other professionals, did a really good job of just changing really quickly and it was a real it was a really st very stressful time so then maintaining that has been great people have been good and now that we a lot of states coming out of the restrictions and allowing more contact a lot of the issues that um, people are bringing in their supervision at the moment is how to go back how to go back to a new normal to face to face you know what protocols do I need to put in place can I still offer telehealth you know do I need to wear a mask what brand of sanitizer do I use to sanitize my instruments? You know, those types of questions are now coming out when we seem to be coming at the other end of this isolation period that um, clinicians are wanting to know how to do the next stage. And I think it's really heartening because they've, they've changed their whole business. Now they're more confident in changing back again. They know they can do it. They can do a drastic change. And they know now that with the right support, they can move back into doing safe, effective um face-to-face -face work as well as keeping the online stuff going so I find what's interesting is a lot of um, my clients are saying I really like doing the telehealth some of my clients like doing telehealth um, I can do telehealth for clients who are a long way away who, per who previously couldn't access it so now what we're looking at I think as a profession is moving towards a combination of in-person and online sessions for the foreseeable future. That definitely makes um, a lot of sense. I think any any kind of resistance or um, perhaps, you know, telehealth a year ago was kind of everybody was sort of aware of it, but nobody was really, you know, running at it and embracing it. There are um, exceptions. There are, you know, some uh, health providers that have done a fantastic job at becoming fully telehealth um, and have uh, grown quite nicely in that respect. But, yeah, so now that we've sort of experienced it, um, we don't really need to throw it out either just because the lockdowns uh, are over. And I think that can be said for... Uh, uh, the clients as well, um, who perhaps never thought about it as being a legitimate option. And now it's kind of, they're experiencing it as well. Um, so I'd like to think that it will continue. I think, I think it'd be good for, uh, health practitioners, their clients. I think it'd be good for the industry, um, as a whole. Um, but yeah, I can see what you mean about sort of some of the challenges we sort of, we've adapted now to the lockdowns and now we have to almost kind of adapt back in some way. That's right. Yeah, and there's been actually some beautiful success stories of some clients who have, you know, actually flourished using telehealth because they do find some of the social interaction too intense, um, especially perhaps um, children who are neurodiverse and they just, they find interpersonal contact very difficult. Doing it through a screen has given them that space. And uh, one of my clients actually gave me a beautiful story where 
there was a client who the the child they didn't know had an affinity for music and had never experienced it before and they jumped into some telehealth sessions and then the very first session the child was just engaging for a whole half an hour the child sang for the first time the child engaged in this music and they smiled and laughed and and the you know the dad was at the side of the room just leaning against the door frame just with tears streaming down his face because he'd never ever seen his child engage that way and didn't, had no idea that music could bring out such an amazing thing for this child. So there have actually been some beautiful stories in terms of clients um, who for whom telehealth works better than in person at this particular time for them. Um, and also for some clinicians, because as we know, you know, clinicians are human. We also have um, sometimes physical health problems, chronic health problems, uh, mental health problems ourselves. And I've actually had a couple of clients say, this is great. As a therapist, I can do better work because I'm not driving for, you know, 50 hours a week in my car. I'm not lugging my gear from home to home or facility to facility. I can actually make this telehealth work for me and actually do more work and better work. So, you know, it's it's been surprising but delightful to hear such uh, such wonderful positive stories out of this kind of, you know, panic to, to get onto telehealth. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's pretty consistent with uh, what I'm hearing around the traps as well. And uh, I think people are sort of, you know, gone from dabbling into it to um, being forced to do it to actually now going, oh, it's actually, it's not too bad. It's This can actually work. And, um, you know, there seems to be a lot more uh, literature popping up around the traps as well that sort of demonstrates that both scientifically as well as um, empirically and also supporting, I guess, uh, other people's experiences of it as well. Do you think that the, uh, the business model of... Um, uh, Allied Healthcare has an opportunity here to transform as well uh, from moving out of kind of having a, the costs of always being in one location, for example, to um, sort of taking advantage of mobility or being able to deliver the service anywhere, anytime. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely think that's the case. And I think especially for music therapists and perhaps some other arts-based therapists that we've been a little reluctant to to go to telehealth to use online, you know, practice management software, digital health um, tools. I think we've been a little reluctant because we we really have been concentrating on doing good therapy and that's fantastic. But I think now that we've been forced to get online, forced to engage with the technology more, I think it will make massive opportunities, as I said, for people to see people in rural areas or in other states and territories where they may not have been able to do that before. Um, it relieves them of that having to drive all the time, the costs of vehicles, the costs of perhaps having a clinic or those types of things. Even if it's a part-time, part-time kind of situation, I think the, the business of music therapy is just going to, to really move forward into the 21st century finally and, uh, and we can embrace these opportunities to do better work, to provide more flexible options for our clients, especially for those who are unable to, to travel or that we can't travel to them because it's, it's just it's too far. So, yeah, I think the business will really be be um, adapting and growing. And do you think on the other side of the equation that that could be good for also uh, hiring and how you actually build a team of uh, allied health practitioners uh, who might value having that work-life balance uh, in a better way based from home? What are your thoughts? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think as a, as a, as an employer, it's fantastic because again, you can have you can have staff all over the country and potentially all over the world. And as a as a, a music therapist or as another allied health, and as you may know, allied health is a primarily. Um, women and a lot of us have home responsibilities perhaps children and to be able to have that balance to work from home without commutes without without the um the stresses of of child care financially and logistically i think yes for employers and employees alike in the health industry this is a great a great boon because we can we can balance that more we can actually do the work we're paid to do instead of all the having to worry about all those other things and and a lot of women i know in the health industry we feel like we're not doing a good job when we're at home with our kids because we're thinking about work and we're not doing a good job at work because we're worried about our kids. And so if we can mitigate that somewhat by having at least part-time working from home and doing the telehealth, I think, yes, absolutely, for the workforce in general, it would be a fantastic idea. Yeah, it's definitely been something in the, in the tech sector. Uh, it's probably been a good 15 years where remote working has um, has been in place. Um, we're a, we're a uh, fully remote operation as well. And um, I know that our team absolutely values uh, you know, being able to have that integration. I mean, it's a different different skill set, so to speak, but still we're, we're all human and um, we all want to be able to um, optimise the amount of time we put into our working lives compared to our personal lives, family lives, hobbies, interests, and so on and so forth. So I think that um, has really been cracked open now as, um, as way more of a possibility for how healthcare might be able to work. 
Um, but there's always a question that pops up, particularly around um, physical therapies, that kind of uh, hands-on uh, kind of therapy where um, I hear there's kind of, there seems to be a, um, a division in the communities around whether, um, you know, telehealth can actually, you know, no, I'm not going to use the word replace, but can be, can augment that kind of um, healthcare. Are you seeing any examples with uh, some of your clients around where that is working and it's working quite nicely? Yeah, look, there is there is a question around the more physical aspect of doing this type of work. So say for a music therapy, and I know obviously for things like um, physio, osteo, OT, those types of things, you need to be able to be there sometimes to make sure people are being safe in their movements and people doing things the right way. And what we're finding in music therapy um, is that if the client is unable to because they're a child or because they have a certain disability, if they're unable to participate fully and safely in the in the session, it's really important to have a facilitator there. So a carer or a parent or a friend or someone to help facilitate that to ensure the safety and to ensure the effectiveness of the therapy. Because it's all very well and good to say, yeah, we can do therapy from anywhere in the world. But if it's not effective, then we're not doing our job and we're not being ethical. So absolutely, there are always considerations for the more physical aspects of perhaps playing an instrument or, or practicing movements after surgery or you know doing all those types of things that we we do in person if we can make the technology or have the the, the resources the, the people there to help then that's always optimal and of course it's not always going to be appropriate to do certain things over telehealth we need to acknowledge that as well yeah absolutely there's um there's a concept within uh, digital health uh which is called uh activated carers um is that a is that a terminology that uh exists day to day in out, out in the field or assisted That's carers not, not a term that i've come across no it, it basically went as you were describing that 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 is um essentially what it's saying is that sometimes there's uh people around the client wherever they happen to be who can actually um be activated to support the therapist remotely to um do aspects of the therapy that um, perhaps that therapist can't do physically because they are doing it from a distance um, and that's what I picked up in what you were just saying there, that that's a possibility of working with uh, uh, other people around the client who can support that person through those instructions or through those uh, guidelines. Is that is that Did I get that right? Exactly right, yes, and that's a great term. I like that term, activated carer, because it means the carer can get information and education from the therapist and work alongside the, the therapist and alongside their um, their loved one or their, or their client. Um, and I think, you know, the, the medical system is we're going away from that medical system. We're now into a more client directed, strengths based um, way of working in music therapy. We've always kind of worked in that way. And if we can have a client centered, family centered uh, way of practicing and if telehealth can support that with activated carers, I think that's a great thing. It's a win. Um, look, from my point of view, it, it seems to make a lot of sense and I think it's going to be an interesting evolution for um, how healthcare gets reimagined um, going forward, bearing in mind um, just how integrated now the, the digital world is with our, with our real world, um, so to speak. I mean, some, some people spend a lot of time online, um, you know, their, their social groups or their interactions with the world uh, is predominantly through an interface, through a mobile phone, for example. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, generationally things are changing in that direction where you know, um, our, the way we connect with each other, the way we actually socialise, the way we actually experience our lives is very heavily intertwined with the, with the digital realm. I mean, most of us could relate to buying stuff online. Mm. Um, so seeing that evolution with healthcare now, moving that direction, um, I think it's fascinating and really exciting. Um, yep. But I'm hearing what you're saying around that kind of clinical governance that has to come with it. Um, have you kind of experienced some challenges or um do you see uh, some quick wins or perhaps some things to be mindful of in how to actually maintain clinical governance in an online setting? Yeah, look, I think it's it's evolving, as you said, and it is, it's very exciting, but we do need to make sure that we do have these checks and balances in place. And again, uh, talking about um, being transparent and being overt, I think we just need to be extra, extra careful of those things. So keeping our notes the way we need to keep them, managing the confidentiality and the technology um, with clinical governance and having policies and procedures in place. And our, our national organisations are doing those types of things. So the Australian Music Therapy Association is looking into, you know, best practice guidelines and how do we keep ourselves and our clients safe. So I think it's a it's an ongoing conversation that we're having, but just putting into practice all those normal, regular best practice things we would be doing of keeping keeping notes and having emergency plans in place and all those 
all those clinical governance things, we can translate those quite well and quite easily to telehealth. We just need to now have a bit of the paperwork and a bit of uh, some official stuff behind it to, to back us up. And you've got you've got quite a few resources on your uh, website, Natalie, and, and and there's a couple of different ways that you actually deliver your supervision. I think um, you were saying you do individual as well as uh, group type arrangements. Do you want to sort of talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Yanni. Yeah, I do. As I said, I do predominantly um, online supervision. Um, I do have a I do have a studio, as you can see, that people can come to in Melbourne if they'd like to. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I do one on one supervision via telehealth, which now everyone is familiar with, which is lovely. Um, and also I do group supervision either in person or online as well. So we have the brilliant technology nowadays that we can do group supervision online. So that's definitely something that I offer. I also provide webinars and they're all available on my website and I provide, um, I'm shortly hopefully going to be providing some more training, training and supervision and workshops and supervision, that type of thing. So I do professional development as well. Fantastic. Um, so tell me, what, what what's the relationship like with uh, referrers? Is that a big part of um, uh, historically music therapy and, and now kind of broadly the uh, clients that you're working with? Are you seeing a lot of um, referrers also moving into the cloud and kind of working through tele-referral kind of arrangements? Is that, are you seeing any, any movement in that direction? This is something that's still not happening very much in the music therapy world. As I said, we're just dipping our toes into the, the, the digital health kind of world and it's something that is evolving. Um, we, I think my sense of it is that music therapists get most of their referrals from other clients at the moment and still there's a way to go with, for music therapists to educate perhaps GPs, other allied health, nursing, those types of people to get more referrals and more um, multidisciplinary collaboration in that, in that realm. So I think once perhaps the the digital health and the online messaging secure messaging things get more used in the health profession at large and then of course in the music therapy profession and other allied health then we will be able to step more into that way of working together community and communicating with those community-based other health professionals yeah definitely something that's emerging in music therapy for now well, um, I guess as a little bit of a, a sneak peek just um, on that, we um, will have some announcements coming out shortly around how um, all kind of allied health practitioners can actually publish their um, their availability to um, other points of care. Um, so that's going to be really, uh, I hope it actually um, solves some of that challenge and problem. There's, there, there is definitely some systemic challenges in actually getting referrals done properly, um, you know, both securely and privately, as well as also um, have have a good, meaningful use context in terms of how that clinical handover uh, occurs. Um, so I'll keep everybody posted. Um, we're hoping over the next two weeks we'll be able to make an announcement in that regard. Um, but let's switch gears a little bit. So let's let's talk about the uh, future as you see it. Perhaps uh, Natalie, let's take uh, I don't know three to five years out. How do you how do you see a practice operating um, in three to five years time? Where, where's where's healthcare going to be at in your in your um, mindset? Look, I think um, I think we're really going to embrace the the flexibility that we have now with telehealth. And I think while people are very keen, I know, to get back to in person healthcare because a lot, you know, that's a lot of what we do is in person stuff, and that's our skill set as therapists and as healthcare professionals. I really think and hope, I guess, that telehealth will be a viable option and a long-term option. And whether it's even just one or two clients that, that that prefer that way or that logistically it works for them, I really, really hope and I think that people will keep it on board as a long-term prospect. Um, I also think that we will get there with the secure messaging and digital health and online practice management because we have to go that way. We have to go the way that the government is encouraging us to go in terms of keeping our records online, communicating with other health professionals. And I think now that I, I think the dam is broken almost with people's uh, reluctance to do digital health and telehealth has really just made us get into that space. And so what I'm thinking in five years' time is there's going to be a lot more people on board with it, a lot more people using the online um, platforms like Core Plus that we have available to us to, to manage our practices and to do all those different aspects of, you know, of messaging and of referring and billing and scheduling those types of things, because really it saves a whole lot of time doing it manually, as we know. So um, I really think that now this, the COVID-19 experience of having to very rapidly move to online services will, will help re people realise that this is actually the way we're going to go and will encourage them to do more in that space in the future. 
Uh, oh, well, look, I you know how I feel about that. I absolutely agree. I think um, you know I I really like the idea of having a version of life where um, allied health um, is truly allied and is actually cooperating with each other and cross referring and uh, uh, building kind of you know virtual teams around um, a client and supporting their respective needs, communicating really well. Um, I think that would be great, and I think uh, you know the. The, the the demand for it, I think, exists. I think we have notoriously had a problem at, at a system level. Um, and I think, uh, you know, with uh, some of the initiatives that we put in place with a lot of the GP systems and specialist systems that we connect to, um, that systemic side is overcome, but now it's kind of a cultural thing to actually see it working and, um, and to experience it. It's a bit like telehealth. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, 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 we know telehealth's out there, but now we were forced kind of, you know, to move very rapidly into it. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm, I'm getting some mixed feelings. Some people have thought about it as being quite stressful. I don't think that's the majority. I think uh, the majority have generally thought, oh, actually, this is easier than I expected. Would you agree with that? Did you get that sense of feedback as well? Yes, I do. Look, a lot of the a lot of the feedback right at the beginning was that it was very stressful and very tiring to do that. But I think that's a matter of having to change your whole business model, as we talked about, and the and the effort that's required to interact online and ensure that the interactions are great. Um, but then, as people have gone on, they've gone actually, this is okay now. I'm getting used to it, and it's not as not as scary as I thought. So yeah, definitely. Um, Definitely, as you said, things are, have been stressful for some people and that's always going to happen. Um, but the vast majority of, of music therapists that I've spoken to and other health professionals have found it, have found it really quite good. Are there any other uh, kind of digital health tools that are needed by music therapy? Yeah, look, I think I think a lot of the things that the, the full-featured um, offerings like Core Plus and others um, are very would be very very welcome for music therapy like online billing and online scheduling and yeah having the secure messaging so you can really connect with other health professionals for referrals those things are really really important for us because we we didn't you know most of us didn't get into music therapy so we could we could do our accounting and our billing we didn't get into music therapy so we could do our paperwork we got into music therapy so we could help people and spend time with them helping them make their lives better and so any of those digital platforms and tools that can help us to spend more time helping people and less time with the admin stuff is I think is really needed and as, as you said I think there's a cultural um, reluctance to, to get there fully but it's we're on the way you know there are more and more music therapists every day taking up the opportunity to use digital products to help us with our time management to help us get everything together in one place. Um, other things that we do as music therapists that other perhaps allied health might not do is we use a lot of technology for music making. So people will have, you know, they'll have iPads with PDF uh, files on there for sheet music and there are apps for that. And I don't know if there's ever going to be the opportunity for online practice management software to incorporate those musical things. It's quite a unique, I guess, need in the music therapy practice to have to have sheet music online, maybe to connect to YouTube to be able to use the resources and music on YouTube or Spotify or something like that. You know, there are there are some unique things in terms of technology that music therapists use. And so if there was ever a uh, a, a digital tool or an online tool that could help us with that, that connected with our with our um, admin, I don't know, maybe there's all kinds of possibilities there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is that something that actually ultimately um, serves as part of the clinical record and the clinical uh, documentation between yourself and the client? Yeah, absolutely, especially where perhaps clients are doing things like songwriting and the lyrics and the music become an artefact. They become part of the, the clinical work. Oh, has, right. Yep. So lyrics and recordings even of songs uh, or even videos or, I don't know, garage band tracks or things like that, they actually can become a part of the clinical record. So there's, yeah, there's some interesting um, there's some interesting things. I know other other allied health use photographs or, or you know, MRIs or videos or different things like that. And then music therapists also, we have different types of uh, digital artifacts like that, that that form part of the clinical work. Mm. That's really that's really interesting, and and you know as you were saying it, I was thinking that just makes uh, so much sense. Uh, but it's it's kind of like it's it, it. I've never really thought about it in that context before. But maybe mm. there is something where integrations with apps uh, actually make work and uh, make uh, make it work with something like an integration with uh, with Core Plus and uh, some of the other PMSs that um, make it easy for that kind of integration side of it to bring it all into the clinical record. Uh, that could be the case. I know in our in our client record, um, we do allow uh, video and audio files to be uploaded into it. Um, so they're time stamped as well. So if somebody's actually sharing that with you, either through the online booking process, mm -hmm. that can actually then be um, saved into the uh, client record. 
Um, but as you were expressing it, I had kind of a, um, a better version of it in my head, but I think there's certainly some capability there now that could sort of make that work. Mm -hmm. Um, but I could see a, I could see a better version of it down, down the road where it's more interactive with, um, with the client, you know, particularly through an online, uh, kind of session as well. Um, but that's, that's a really good insight. I think that's all part of where the journey of digital health goes. It's kind of figuring out those, those ways of actually extending the clinical engagement. And I say this quite a lot when I speak around the traps uh, that, you know, telehealth is not just video. Um, it's actually a lot more. And we're, we're, we're going to discover what that is through the course of time. Right now, video and voice and messaging is what we're actually uh, getting used to. Um, but eventually some of the things that we were doing face-to-face -face or day-to-day -day, that we'll need to find a way to translate those or perhaps even improve on them using, mm -hmm. uh, using digital tools uh, going forward. So... I'm always, I'm, I really love the space and I'm fascinated by the potential of it. So um, I love any kind of feedback that, um, that you have or anybody else that's actually watching this on, on those kinds of potential uh, because it helps us as an industry to actually say to you, is this what you want, Natalie? And we can actually help iterate with you to make something that actually works for, for everybody concerned. Mm, mm. And perhaps some of the, the lesser known about therapies like the arts therapies, like music therapy, art therapy, drama therapy, you know, there are maybe some integrations there in the future that you could make like for, and I'm, I'm sure this is already available, scanning in artwork, pictures of artwork, if that's appropriate, or or videos of movement or, you know, of drama performances, there's drama therapy as well. So there's so much scope, I think, for some of the, the, the newer or lesser known about the creative arts therapies to to be able to explore how we can use that digital um, technology to our advantage and for our clients. So just just to confirm, it's not going to be a TikTok integration. You know, uh, it's not going to be that oh, kind no. of thing. No, no, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's a lot of movement and a lot of music and a lot of stuff going on, uh, you know, through uh, TikTok. But um, yeah, there is. And yeah, I've had clients who say, I say to them, "What's your what's your favorite music?" And they say, "TikTok dance music." And I go. Well, then I'll just go look into that for you. You know, we have to do, we have to follow our clients' leads and, and who knows where that will take us some days. Yep, yep. Oh, well, imagine that. Oh, that'd be um, that'd be a very interesting turn of events. But um, Natalie, Jack, thank you uh, so much for taking some time out. I know you are incredibly busy and um, you are prolific at content and, um, and helping your supervisees as well. So um, I'm sure everybody appreciates um, the effort that you put in. I certainly really appreciated some of the insights you've shared today and thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me. It's really, you know, I'm like you, I love talking about this stuff. I love helping people, supporting those in the industry. So yeah, anytime. And it's been it's been lovely to talk to you. And thank you for your interest in, in allied health and in music therapy. It's great to, to be able to share that information. Oh, I really appreciated it. Thank you, Natalie. Bye-bye.